today's webinar. On your screen, you can see Andrew. You will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. You also can see Jim on the screen too. He's here hanging out with us. So Andrew Paris earned his PhD at MIT as part of the Lean Aircraft Initiative and worked for Lockheed Martin for 11 years, mostly as process improvement lead on the Atlas rocket program. Andrew is currently Process Excellent Manager at the faith-based Swiss humanitarian NGO Medair and provides lead training and coaching to quality champions in developing countries for the International Trade Center. And I believe that is it from me. Andrew, you can take over. Great. Thank you, Skylar. Thank you, Jim, also. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Looking forward to spending this time together. I'll bring myself over here, and uh, let's get started. So what I'd like to do is share with you a vision for process excellence, seven habits for the journey and pursuit of process excellence. What we'll do is uh, begin with my story, talk about process excellence, the seven habits. I'll share with you a number of examples from NGOs and SMEs, that is small and medium enterprises who are applying lean and also invite you to consider coaching some of these amazing people who I've trained and who are making some of these improvements. So my story begins, I was born in Hollywood, grew up in the Los Angeles area, attended at UC Berkeley undergrad, Worked for two years in 3Com in Silicon Valley, then got my master's and PhD at MIT, where I first learned about lean as part of the lean aircraft or lean aerospace, as it later became known, uh, initiative, which the, the question in this organization, in this <clears throat> initiative was, does lean apply outside of automobiles? Back then in 1993, when I got started, that was an open question. Now we know it applies to so many uh, sectors and increasingly so many different types of organizations across the globe, which we'll get into in just a moment. Uh, after getting my PhD and a year in Gordon-Conwell Seminary, I joined Lockheed Martin, working mostly on the Atlas rocket program. And in around the year 2005, I read a book that changed my career. And the book is called Walking with the Poor. And Walking with the Poor is a book by Brian Myers, one of the former senior leaders of World Vision International. And what struck me in this book was reading about how World Vision partners with communities to help them walk out of poverty. And I discovered the role of a development facilitator and as you'll notice, it sounded awfully familiar to what I was doing as a process improvement facilitator. What does the, the development facilitator do? Well, they find out what the community wants. They don't tell the community what to do. They don't do things for the community. They help them solve problems at the root cause. They rely on the expertise of the community to know what the plan needs to be, to, give, to keep ownership of the plan of improvement to the community. They serve as the methodology expert, not as the, again, expert in the community itself. And they build capacity so that they basically work themselves out of a job so they're no longer needed. And I thought, huh, that is what I'm doing as a process improvement facilitator inside the organization. I would love to join World Vision. And that's what I, a year later, was able to do. And that's really been what took me on the trajectory in these last 15 years in my career, nine of them with World Vision, three of those in East Africa living in Nairobi with my family. We'll talk about that in a moment. And now for the last six and a half years living in Switzerland, working for Medair, I also am partnering with the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and their humanitarian operations and supply chain management lab. And I'm also working with as a consultant with the International Trade Center in their Quality Champions Program. But since that book, my career has been focused on NGOs and small and medium enterprises. When I came into World Vision, I learned a lot about what World Vision calls transformational development, how they partner with communities out of poverty. And I came with the experience from the corporate sector, Lean, Six Sigma, business process management, innovation, these things. And what I attempted to do and did was to marry that or integrate that with the world vision development and humanitarian 
uh, principles, practices, values, and integrate those into one view of what does an excellent process look like? What are we aiming for and how we want to work together and how we want to serve people who are in need? And these are the five elements of process excellence. They are effective impact, efficient performance, appropriate to context, empowering to stakeholders, and continuously improving. If we take a look at, at a second level, effective means the processes are reliable. That means they're, they're predictable, they're consistent, they deliver quality, and do that safely. Delivering value means giving what the customer needs, what benefits the customer. In the case of an NGO, it's the people whom we're serving. In the case of any company, it is, it is generally your paying customers. Efficient means that the processes are simple, easy to do correctly. They're standard, they're timely with minimizing waste and they're integrated with one another in an optimal manner. The next two are more focused on NGO values, but I think are equally essential for any private sector company or government agency for that matter is that the process is appropriate. And this is, means that we're showing respect for everyone who's involved with or affected by our work. We're flexible. Flexible means we can use this process in different contexts. And when the context changes, because we work in a, a volatile context, we don't have to reinvent the process. We can still use it. And the technology that we use is appropriate, whether to the people, the purpose, or the environment. Next, that the process is empowering. We're making decisions locally, strategically. And we're partnering with building capacity of developing mutual benefit with our stakeholders and the people. We have the people and they have the capacity, the information, technology, tools, et cetera, that they need to excel. And finally, we're continuously improving. That means we're measuring our process, have a process owner responding to what, what, what we're learning from the process. When there's problems, we correct them quickly. And when we're also being proactive to apply our learning. This next slide shows the detail of process excellence. Um, the reason I came to uh, East Africa was I was visiting East Africa in my role in World Vision. I was helping to write a handbook on integrated programming, how World Vision partners with communities. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't want to just come and take information. I want to offer, I want to give something in return. So I said, hey, would you like me, would you like to hear about process excellence? And in the three countries where I did that, in uh, Tanzania, Uganda, and Burundi, the response was, yes, we'd like to hear about it. And the response was so positive that people said, Andrew, please come teach us this, help us, help us with these things. And in fact, I was able to do that for three years, which we'll talk about more in a moment. One of the things uh, that I always tell people when we talk about process excellence is that excellence is a journey, not a destination. That means we become excellent not from reaching excellence, but from pursuing it. So if we have excellence as our goal of what we're striving for in our processes, then what are the things that we need to do? What are the things that everyone in the organization can do to pursue process excellence? And again, this needs to work in, in the offices in Switzerland. It needs to work in the offices in every country that we're in, uh, DR Congo, Somalia, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera, um, with all levels of, of uh, education, background, skill, et cetera. So what I did was I took the lean tools, the lean techniques, and broke them into these seven habits, or grouped them rather into these seven habits of process improvement. You'll, as you, th as you go through these, think about all the lean tools that you're aware, uh, familiar with, and you can see that they fit into these seven and the first one is, in very simple language, organize the area. So this is 5S or 6S if you like to add safety, which we do. Um, the second is making work visual. In part, it's uh, outlining where things belong, labeling what things are, but it's also setting targets, K KPIs, targets, and measuring the performance of our process so we can visually see how our processes are performing and respond to that. The next one is standardized work. Standardized work means CIPOC diagrams, process maps, work uh, SOPs, work instructions, forms and checklists, all the ways of expressing and capturing and sharing what is the best known way of doing the work in the organization. 
and using that to teach new people and to continuously improve how we work. Eliminating waste, this is in part what you see here in the, in the stoplight colors, value adding, required non-value adding, period non-value adding, but we also get into the nine different types of muda and muda, mura and muri unevenness, as well as overburden on people, which is something we find in our work quite frequently. Uh, the next is eliminating waste, uh, sorry, preventing mistakes. So just like this little prevention to, to uh, so we don't accidentally hit the uh, fire alarm, preventing mistakes from happening, detecting them as quickly as possible, preventing them, preventing them from becoming failures. So I teach FMEA with this. And we're always looking, though, for inexpensive, low-cost, quick, easy things to do to make sure that we're producing high quality and not inspecting quality into our processes. And then making workflow integrates all of the things around reducing duplication, uh, duplicate uh, uh, approvals, handoffs, and delays. This is where we talk about reducing inventory, doing Kanban, uh, making the process flow smoothly from beginning to end. And lastly, number seven is really something we're doing throughout all of these seven habits, which is solving problems. So this is plan, do, check, act, A3 thinking, Toyota, Kata, to make however you want to slice and dice it. It's getting, it's not blaming people, but blaming the process and looking for, <clears throat> for root causes that we can solve to find better ways of doing things. And these fit actually nicely into two uh, well, two groups and plus one, one alone. The first group, these th first three, organize the area, make work visual and standardize work, are about stabilizing the process, getting it repeatable, find, again, finding the best known way of doing it, making sure all the tools, et cetera, are easily accessible. Pe people can see what's going on. They know how to work and so forth. Stabilize the process. Then we optimize the process by eliminating waste, preventing mistakes, making workflow, and all the time looking at making sure we're really solving problems at the root. So on the one hand, we want to know what is happening and what should be happening. We want to make the process better. And we want our scientific and creative approach to all of this by addressing root causes. So these are the uh, seven habits, again, that I've, I've trained people and have asked them now to use these to, to make improvements in how they do their work. And I want to be, uh, share briefly a number of examples from World Vision first, then Medair, and then some of the small and medium enterprises I've worked uh, with, or my, the quality champions that I've trained rather have worked with in developing countries. So in East Africa, this was in the middle of 2011 to the middle of 2014, I trained about 450 people in my one-day energizer training. We trained, uh, we had a one-week Lean Six Sigma green belt and a four-week black belt course that I didn't teach, but we crowdsourced that pro bono, which was wonderful. Um, then we, of these people who, who we trained, we, many, many improvements were made. Uh, the challenge, as, as you all know, is getting people to document the improvements that they're making. We did, we were able to doc, document 33 larger process improvement projects and 32 smaller make it better improvements. We were working with supply chain so we reduced uh working with our suppliers we reduced annual cost by one over one and a half million on the processes where we targeted we reduced span time by almost 60 percent and we contributed to reducing underspending now for those of you in the private sector that may not make sense but if you're an ngo you want to spend the money that's been given to you underspending is a sign that you're not able to to handle the work that you said you were going to do so we were able to reduce underspending a good thing trans begin to transform our culture improve our reputation and actually get more resources as a result i won't read through the details here you, you can look at them while i'm speaking but this group here are our some of the uh, 11 people that that we trained in the black belt training are uh, there there's me there's our instructor uh, prashant paul from india who came came out to help us with that these folks will tell you that this methodology lean lean six segment that this works in their in their environment in their context in medair we're also um also doing uh the one day energizer the one week green belt these are some improvements that were made 
Uh, I came back a year later. They said, hey, Andrew, we need to tell you about the, some of the things that we've done. Uh, we created a process map for procurement through the payment process, which significantly reduced our conflicts and confusion. We created an SOP for shipping before we had many challenges. Afterwards, our error rate has been significantly reduced, and we have no more problems with waybills and shipments. Two more examples. When goods were delivered into customs, we were not ready to pick them up. What they did is they created a checklist of documents that they need to have ready. Now, when things arrive in customs, they're ready to go pick them up immediately. A log pack, which is a group of uh, procurement documents, were for things that were bought in Somalia, they used to sh ship this package of paper documents to Nairobi to look at them to make sure that they're correct and then ship them back or fly them back with people who are going back and forth back to Somalia. And then they corrected them and they would send them back to Nairobi. Now, after having made improvements, they simply just do it correctly the for, for the first time and send them once to Nairobi. Uh, Tom Russell, one of our uh, wash, wash means water, sanitation, and hygiene in the DR Congo uh, advisors. He created out of Excel a, a, a template a work, workbook to create a budget for wash construction. It took the time for that task down from 32 hours to seven minutes. Uh, before, one had to manually enter all the total quantities and costs, add them up. Now, what he did... What he did is he created a, an Excel workbook when simply types, enters in the number of uh, by location. These are the different locations. These are the different types of things that, that need to be produced. And uh, automatically is calculated the different types of materials and the, the dollar value for these things. Again, seven minutes rather than 32 hours to, to do this work. Um, one of the uh, now I'm going to switch over to my work with the International Trade Center and Quality Champions. Um, I do want to say that uh, I didn't put it here, but I was inspired many years ago by a story uh, that is on the Lean Frontiers website about improvements that they that, that friends of their friends of Jim, I believe, had made in Africa. Um, who were working with local populations and the improvements that they made in production of beeh beehives and maybe some other wooden products. So wanted to uh, give a big thanks to, to, uh, to them for, for that. All right, I see the question, I'll come to it at the end. Uh, so here are some examples uh, in Laos, uh, a, a food production company. So they, were, they had to have uh, proper hygiene. You can see the uh, nice organization Cleaning and uh, a cleaning schedule and instructions for the different areas in in this in this factory. Nicely organized tools. Um, in another company, they created uh, temperature settings per product with visual identification of what products needed which temperature temperature settings on sealing uh, equipment in order to seal the packets. Uh, this is for packets of tea. This is another package uh, device. Uh, settings, temperature settings, a wood processing company. They created a checklist. This is what it looked like during the workshop. This is what it looked like in actual use at this company, PML. Um, at the Forest Institute of the Lao University, they redesigned their, their wood shop, demonstration wood shop. They gave a nice high level process of how uh, overview of how wood is processed. And then for each machine, they created a detailed set of work instructions for how to use that machine. Another wood processing company did Pareto analysis for downtime and found some of the key causes for, for downtime and were able to reduce machine downtime from 60 to 40% and increased output from 30 to 50%. Another company, uh, wood processing, they analyzed why they were losing, uh, why they had to throw away pieces of, of uh, plywood uh, after they were dried and they analyzed it. One of the causes was incorrect movement by staff. They were able to reduce that by 71%, but because they were collecting the data, they, they also noticed that they had increased the lost uh, items, uh, lost pieces due to incorrect or inconsistent heat, which which we determined was 
at least in part because they added one more stacking pallet to the two that they already put in the oven at the same time. So they're trying to re in improve the uh, throughput, but we could see that increased uh, problem there. But because they were capturing data, they could see that and they could work on it. One of the, for me, one of the most exciting things uh, is, is not only the improvement of the processes, but also the cultural transformation that, that people are empowered. People who are maybe used to more hierarchical ways of operating are empowered, are asked to improve. So we can see that after they've gone through the training, the staff understood the roles better. They had stand up meetings and they were more, much more actively involved in making improvements to their work. Um, Nepal is another country I, I worked with, uh, and uh, coffee, uh, coffee unions. You can see here's our different SO uh, work instructions for each of the different pieces of equipment that this gentleman is pointing out to. They they uh, provided standards for those who are picking the coffee cherries so that they would know what is the right time to pick the cherry and what they should bring to the coffee processors. Uh, when it's before, when it's after, but what's the right, what's the best time and, and type of look on coffee beans to pick. Um, a number of them created forms and checklists to do better record keeping. And um, again, we can see uh, in another processing facility that through analyzing the workflow, mapping processes, they were able to streamline their operations, reducing processing time by 30%. Not only did they improve productivity, but they also increased the cleanliness and the hygiene of the beans, which means that they are able to sell them then for higher value to the market. You can see one, one of the production workers, uh, Sushila, said, we can now easily access the required tools and resources, that's because of the 5S, which reduced our time and improved the overall workflow. So the... The vision of process excellence, effective, efficient, appropriate, empowering, continuous improving, and the seven habits, organize the area, make work visual, standardize the work, eliminate ways to prevent mistakes and make work flow, and also solving problems. Th through these basic concept, lean concepts and tools, the innovation champions at NGOs or the quality champions at SMEs are, these are amazing people and they are doing amazing things in, to improve processes and organizational performance. At the same time, these are people who need coaching. They're really, uh, they're just getting started in their journey, in their journeys of, of leading. They're applying what I've taught them, uh, but at the same time, they need coaching to accelerate their learning and their impact. And I wanted to offer you or invite you to uh, consider this opportunity. It's called Lean 360. Uh, I've created this with my friend, Sammy Obara from Hansha. Uh, he put up, he put this website together and it's an opportunity. Here's the link to it for Lean Six Sigma or Lean Lean Six Sigma professionals to share their expertise. Uh, what we're asking for is a three month initial commitment up to an hour a week with either an innovation champion at an NGO or an equality champion at a, at a, who's working with a small medium enterprise to accelerate their application learning and impact in the areas of improving teaching, coaching, facilitating, or promoting continuous lean and continuous improvement. Uh, at the bottom of the page, there's a lot of, in the middle, but at the bottom of the page, one can sign up as a coach. If you'd like to do that, please, uh, please do so. Um, so that is uh, my presentation. You can reach me at andrewpalum.mit.edu on my personal email address or my work meta address or also on WhatsApp. Uh, at least in Europe, most everyone's on WhatsApp and that's a pretty convenient way for me. Um, I do have my own website also. This would be a place to find articles that I've written that go into much more detail about these things that I've presented to you today, including a May this year article in the American Society for Quality, Lean Six Sigma review that goes into a bit more detail on the uh, seven habits of process improvement. And this is the link for lean360.org to sign up for coaching. And if there are 
any questions, I would be delighted to try to answer them. I'm going to, I have the uh, Andrew, one question. I, yes. I do, if you can't get it pulled up, I do have one question that um, was sent in. Would you I like do. to either? Yeah, I, I see okay. it. So from, from Mike Perfect. Bukowski, uh, what KPIs have you used to measure process excellence? So that's an interesting one. Um, the way I measure process excellence is through uh, a, a maturity model, basically, approach. So one is really bad and five is really good. So I, I give the descriptions, as you saw earlier, of the elements of process excellence, 15 sub-elements of process excellence, and I ask people to rate them from one to five, one being really bad, five being really good. And that's and, and then I ask them to rate right where they put the number where they want to be and then we see where the gaps are the biggest and that can give them some direction on how they want to you know, what aspect of their process that they want to improve for the most part however you know, if we're measuring the process performance we're just using the kpis that are most important for that process whether it's cost quality or schedule or some variation thereof um yeah, thanks, Silvio, for your comment. It is fantastic. It, it's wonderful the things that folks are doing. Uh, let me, uh, what about political issues that you interfere with the results? <laughs> um, gosh, well, we try, <laughs> try and stay out of politics. Um, but um, one of the things that, I, that, that uh, fascinated me was somebody asked me, Andrew, how do you, how do you reason with these people that this is a good way to to go and that they should be doing these things. And I've really found out that um, I don't need to prove it. I don't need to, to convince anyone that these things are good. When I simply present what lean is and what the process excellence is and what these, what the uh, seven habits are, they're presented in a way that makes sense to people, that speaks to people. Um, and so really uh, m most everyone is eager to get on board. And when they start practicing it, they, 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 uh, are, are, are eager to do it. Of course, there's always challenges in getting leadership involved, getting people to really understand what, what, the, what the tools are, how to apply them. Those are, I suppose, the, the, the bigger challenges that, that we're facing. Uh, let me try and go through the next question. Will, Brian is asking, will the recording be sent? Definitely, uh, that was mentioned by Scarler already. Within 24 hours, you should get that. Um, I'm curious, uh, have you ever seen white saviorism ever come up in this work to support folks in other countries? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think all people who do process improvement want to help other people. Um, and uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting to help other people. What What is uh, wrong is doing it in a way that's condescending, doing it in a way that I have the answers and you need my help and I'm going to, I'm going to, do things for you or tell you what to do. Uh, and that's why the book, uh, Walking with the Poor, was so helpful to me in understanding how and uh, how World Vision and other uh, leading NGOs are working with the poor. Um, they do talk about the Messiah complex. You, know, you don't have to be white to, to think you're a savior for someone else. Um, anyone can have a Messiah complex. Um, and it is something that the book really addresses. And that's why those seven principles are so important. Important. We don't do things for people. We don't tell them what to do. We don't tell them what their process or what their life should look like. We let them uh, say, here's what we want our life to be like. We ask them to do the analysis. We're just the experts in the methodology. We're just encouraging them, helping them, walking with them. And that's, you know, you, you can't uh, be, a, be a savior in this way if, if you're walking with folks. So hopefully that addresses that uh, that question uh, do companies people you're working with have leadership buy in ensuring they are s staying true to the approach so well you know that's that's the big question so um it's easy uh, uh i would say to get people excited about this uh, the people who are workers on the shop floor or in the office managers um to get leaders to support this um, it's one thing to get encouragement and endorsement from the leadership, to get the leadership on board, to get them 
really learning and understanding and leading lean, that for me is a really big challenge. That's that's where um, I, I think the, the big struggle is to, to get the leadership, not just supportive and encouraging and saying, yeah, go ahead, Andrew, and do it. But Andrew, we're going to take this on. You support us. Um, that's that's the uh, I, I suppose the uh, the goal that that uh, we all want to achieve is where leadership is really take, taking the reins and and the experts are are, are supporting them and and implementing what they are uh, trying to achieve within the organization. And I think that brings us to the half hour. Yes, perfect. Our questions. Does anybody have any more questions before we hop off of here? Uh, thank you, David. Okay. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. Oh, we do have one. Uh, what requirements do you have to be a coach? Um, a couple of years, you, you can take a look, um, a, a, a couple of years of experience at least, uh, the more experienced you are, the more experienced person I, I, I can connect you with. But typically, I would say three to five years doing lean, practicing it. Uh, if you're teaching it, if you're coaching it, if you're if you're implementing it, that would be uh, that would be sufficient. Because again, these folks are they've gotten some of them have gotten just the one day energizer training. But most of the people I would connect you with have been through my one week lean green belt. So if if you're above that level, if you've been practicing it for some time, that's what we're looking for. All right, Andrew, I think that is the final one. <laughs> yep. So but thank you so much for facilitating today. And um, we look forward to seeing everybody soon. Just a quick reminder, you will receive a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours. It will come directly from me. Thank you again, Andrew. We'll see everyone later. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Take, Take care. Bye-bye. Goodbye.